By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have some nice old school magic for you. This is a game between a white weenie deck, so a quick aggro deck, against really your traditional control deck, a blue and white brew. And the nice thing is this is actually a finals. It is the finals of the X Points old school format and they have a monthly competition. So each month they go online and they battle each other and this is the finals. These are the two players that got the most points. Now I can hear you think, X Point old school, what is that? Well, let's just look at this slide for a moment. This slide kind of shows you the basics of what X Points is all about. Now, if you'd like to know more about this, I would like to refer to the description below. There you will find a link to the Facebook group of X Point Old School, and you can check out that group and you can find you know everything out. Basically, in a nutshell, a point system in Old School is just a system to um, kind of make sure that you get more diversity in the decks by uh, putting restrictions on specific cards. So, for example, if you want to play Ancestral Recall, you can do so, but it's going to cost you four points. And uh, with X points, I believe you can spend a total of seven points, no more than seven points. So you need to think, am I going to play an Ancestral Recall or a Black Lotus? Since Black Lotus is also four points, so you cannot play them both. Okay, so that's kind of in a nutshell the idea behind this format. So if you'd like to know more, check the description below for the Facebook link. And here we are actually going to continue with the specific deck decks. I've got lovely deck photos, also deck photos that show you how the points are being divided per deck. So that's quite nice if you would like to know more about you know, how that point system works in practice. So you can see it actually on the deck photos. Now, if you want to skip the deck deck, I know some of you want to go straight into the action. You can do so by checking the description below. There you will find timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to game number one. And here we are going to continue with the deck deck. I think I'm going to start with the deck of Yoast, his white weenie brew. Let's take a look. And here we see the deck of Yoast. And I, I would say this is a pretty, pretty typical white weenie brew, right? And as you can see, the X points, they allow you to play with Fallen Empires, which is, of course, making this a better deck than your traditional Swedish, where you cannot play with Fallen Empires. Because I think... Uh, the Javelineers from Fallen Empires, one white for a 1-1 one, one with a Javelineers counter, and you can tap the Javelineer to deal one damage to any target. That actually makes a pretty big difference. That card can be really annoying. And remember, it's also a white creature, so it gets pumped up by the Crusades. And talking about pumped up, the Pump Knights uh, also make quite a big difference. He's only playing with two of them in his deck, the Order of Lightbird. That's what I'm talking about, of course. You can pay two white to give it plus one, plus oh, and you can also give it first strike. Interesting already a decision here that Yost has made is to play with four white knights and only with two orders of light burr um, Where maybe my personal preference would go to play with two more orders of light burrs and maybe two less White knights then again white knight of course also a very strong creature But um, I, I, I wonder what the idea behind that is so maybe Yost if you're listening to this deck deck section You can let me know why did you go for four white knights and two orders of light bearer? I'm sure you have your reasons. And considering you made it all the way to the finals, they're probably the right reasons. Uh, a card that I really enjoy, and I think this is an Italian edition, I can see it by the vivid colors, is the two thunder spirits. Two white and one to cast for a 2-2 white flyer with first strike. So also that first strike. Looking at kind of the first strike amount in his deck, I think Army of Allah would also be quite a nice inclusion. Of course, Army of Allah doesn't give you the uh, consistent bonus that Crusade does. You know, Crusade 2 white to cast enchantment gives all your creatures plus one, plus one, well, all the white creatures, that is. And Army of Allah is an instant for two white and one, and that gives all the creatures plus two, plus O. Oh. And because of that instant bonus, it works so well with first strike. You attack with all your first strikers. I also see Tundra Wolves here. Your opponent is gonna block, not really expecting the Army of Allah. You're playing the Army of Allah, and all of a sudden, you know, your Tundra Wolves is a 3 1 first striker, and it can kill any creature with toughness uh, 3 or less without dying 
uh, without dying himself. So that's quite nice. I think a really cool inclusion in the main board here is King Suleiman. So King Suleiman, uh, one white and one, a card from the Arabian Nights, and you can tap it to kill target Jinn or Afrit. I think that is really sweet, such a sweet inclusion. Um, I actually wish I had a copy of King Suleiman, such a nice card. Uh, so congratulations, Joost, uh, on putting that in your main 60 and also finding yourself in the finals with that card. I wonder how many times you've activated that and actually you're playing against a player. Oh no, 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 your opponent Raymond doesn't play with Surrender Pafrit, so that's a bit unfortunate. I don't really think King Suleiman is going to play a big role in this matchup. Would have been nice though to kind of see it in action. And also we see one Preacher main and two Preacher sideboard. I think Preacher is again one of those cards that's really strong. And interesting here is that uh, Yost really seems to have made that choice of, you know, putting in a Preacher instead of a Sarah Angel. I think a lot of more traditional white weenie decks, they would board out King Suleiman, they would board out Preacher, and they would board in the two Sarah Angels kind of as finishers in the deck. And you can really see that uh, Yost has chosen a different strategy, even more aggressive, you know, taking out the Sarah Angels. And in a way, King Suleiman and Preacher, I guess, are of course not aggressive cards, they're more control cards, but especially the Preacher can create an opening for you. You know, it can steal a creature of the opponent that's also a blocker gone of your opponent, and you're kind of opening up the board to deal some more damage. That's quite nice. And of course, here you see that traditional land tax Armageddon combination that always works very well in these old school white weenie decks. And just for people that don't know, land tax is just this crazy enchantment for one white. And um, if you have less land than your opponent, you can actually go through, during your upkeep, you can go through your library and you can pick three basic lands, up to three, you don't have to, but up to three, show them to your opponent and then put them in your hand. So a land tax is great value. And of course, the combination here is when you have a land tax on the board, you can just play your Armageddon because you probably have enough land anyway. And if you're ahead on board, it's even better. You can play your Armageddon your opponent is gonna see all his lands destroyed, you're gonna see all your lands destroyed, but hey, you're ahead of the board because, for example, you have a Savannah Lines, your opponent has no creatures. So it's it's really a great way, and Armageddon is also a great answer to all those special lands, you know, Mazes of If, Diamond Valleys, um, of course, Mishra's Factories that Yost is playing with himself, it all takes care of that stuff. So Armageddon, I feel, just keeps getting stronger and stronger in old school because the lands in old school are so strong, the mana base, is so important in old school as well. And Armageddon can just wipe that away completely. So Armageddon and land tax combination, really, really strong one. Now, uh, maybe when you're looking at this deck picture, you're thinking, why are there dice on specific cards? Well, that's exactly that point system that I talked about in the introduction. You can spend a total of seven points on cards in your deck. So for example, Soul Ring is a two point card, Chaos Orp is a one point card, Balance is a one point card, and so forth. So if we count the total amount of points here, we get to a nice seven. So that's the amount that he could use. For example, if you wanted to add a Black Lotus in his deck, Black Lotus would have been four extra points. So that means he would, ha would have been forced to take out other cards. So um, for example, his two Mishra's Factories and a Soul Ring just to play one Black Lotus. So it's quite interesting when you start brewing with the point system in the back of your mind. Okay, this is the deck of Yoast. Take one last look or, or hit that pause button if you want to take a closer inspection. Now, let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Raymond. So let's go. And here we see the deck of Raymond, and this is really your traditional control deck. We earlier kind of saw that traditional archetype of aggro in the form of the white weenie deck of Yoast. And this deck is really a control deck. And I think the colors blue and white are just the best if you want to play control. Now, what you see a lot uh, uh, with control decks is they play blue and white as their core colors. And then they play the other kind of colors, to they splash them in, right? But the nice thing about uh, this seven point system is that you kind of just put all your Moxin in your deck and the Black Lotus and not think about it because they cost points. You have seven points to spend in total. If we look at Raymond's Brew, we can see a Mox Sapphire alone is two points. If you want to play a Mox Sapphire and a Mox Pearl, it's going to cost you four points. So that's why he's not playing with that. Also a card that's really missing here at first glance is Ancestral Recall. In my opinion, the most powerful card in Magic, but that card costs four points, right? So a time walk is only two points, where an Ancestral Recall is four points. So if you would choose to play with Ancestral Recall, you've used up more than half of your total seven points. So it's quite interesting brewing a deck 
with having that in mind. Now, if we kind of zoom into what this deck wants to do, it's very similar to uh, the plan that the famous The Deck wants to do. And what these decks want to do basically is make a lot of one-for-one -one trades, like Shorts to Plowsiers. You, you trade your Swords for a creature of your opponent. Disenchant, you trade your Disenchant for an artifact or an enchantment of your opponent. Now, the cool thing is, and the efficient thing here is, is that removal is usually cheaper than the casting cost of the spells. To give you an example, the opponent maybe wants to cast, um, I don't know, a GM Day Tome that we see in Raymond's deck as well. That's gonna cost him four, and a Disenchant is only gonna cost two mana, and you can also play it in the turn of your opponent. These control decks usually, they don't want to do too much at first in their own turn. They just wanna pass turn and wait for their opponent to make the first move. As soon as they start doing something, then the control player starts doing something. You see counter spells, trying to counter away everything that he cannot remove with a disenchant or a swords. For example, I think counterspell could be really important to, to keep control of perhaps the land text, but also keep control, uh, I should say, of the Armageddon, because land text you can still disenchant, right? So playing your counterspells in the right way is very important, and I'm sure Raymond can do that because he's he's made it all the way to the finals. Another interesting card in this deck is Moat. There are three Moats in here. Moat is huge because, I mean, there are not a lot of flyers in the deck of Yo. So if he can have a Moat and if he can protect it with a counter spell, that could be game changing as well. Having said that, Yos is playing with White, so he will have access to disenchants. The problem here for Yos is there are so many targets to disenchant because another key card in this deck is JM Daytome. What the control player wants to do is have control with counterspell, disenchant, swords to plowsiers, icy manipulator, moat, and from that control position go, goes on to having card advantage using his JM Daytomes. Beautifully signed ones, by the way, Raymond, jealous at these three tomes. Um, so those cards are going to give him the card advantage that he needs. And maybe at the right point in the game, he can play a big brain geyser and that will be the game changer. What I like about this deck is that it is not as passive as many control decks. Some control decks are so incredibly passive that you just end up playing really long and long and long and grindy games that you end up losing anyway because the control player basically dictates what happens on the board. This deck can also dictate with the big differences he's playing with four Ezra Drakes and four Sarah Angels so he can also speed up the game so as, as soon as he has control enough mana he can start casting a Sarah Angel probably wanting to keep two blue mana open or you know some other kind of mana combination to make sure that he can counter as well and protect what he's got on the board okay so this is the deck of Raymond, uh, let me know in the comments below what you think of both of these decks and what you think of X Point Old School. And now get ready because we're going to go to the games. Let's start the finals of X Point Old School. Game number one. Here we go with the finals. Yo sitting on the left, Raymond sitting on the right with the Chaos Orb playmat. So we've got the aggro from Yost, White Weenie against the control deck from Raymond. And Yost is off to a good start here. Basic planes into a Tundra Wolves. And a Tundra that's quite unflavored by Raymond here, taking the first damage, going to 19. And there's an order of a Lightbird, a 2 1 Pump Knight from Fallen Empires. Protection from Black. And you can give it first strike for one white and plus one plus oh for two white. And let's see what Raymond can do. Tapping both of his duels. And there is a Felber Stone. So deciding to play a Felber Stone rather than keeping counter spell capability open. There is a Crusade pumping both of the creatures of Yost. That means he can swing in out for five. Look at the life total go down by Raymond. And Elantex, this is a great start for Yost here, really having a couple of good turns. This is what he wants to do. And now Raymond has to find something. Maybe he can find a moat here on turn four. That would be perfect for him. Basic Island. Let's see what he can do. Finding a Chaos Orb. Then the next question is, is he going to flip straight away? It's a good decision because Yost is out tapped, so he can't, cannot respond with a Disenchant. Now the question is, what is he going to flip on? Choosing to go for the Order of Lightbird here, and it is a hit, so Order is gone. Choosing not to flip on the cru Crusade, but on the Order. I think, I think that's probably a good decision here. Second Crusade, 
That means three damage by one little Tundra Wolves. Those Crusades, they are becoming a problem for Raymond. He's already on 11. Yost having two cards in hand, passing turn here. And if Raymond now plays out the land, that means that Yost can activate his land tax next turn, and he does so. So Yost has now has an active land tax. There is a nice Icy Manipulator to answer on the Tundra Wolves, so he's probably going to tap down that Wolves before combat. But first we see Yost here activating his land tax, picking out three basic planes, and of course... After this, he gets to draw another card as well. So that's kind of insane value. Lantex being a really, really strong card. And okay, there we go. Piling up the deck. Taking a card. Let's see what Yost has found. If he can play out even more threats. There's the tap down of the wolves. And there is a Lantex. Wow, so that means that next turn he can actually... Get two land tax triggers. That's kind of insane. And maybe you've noticed it, but Yost decided not to play out a single land. Really want to go for the double land tax activation. And now it's up to Raymond to decide, am I going to go play out another basic? And Raymond's got to feel the pressure. On the other hand, he's able to tap down that one Tundra Wolves. And he's fine. He's not taking any damage. And the longer this game takes, the better it is for Raymond. And he now has access to six mana in total. And there we see Yost, who's going to use his land tax twice, having two on the board. Look at that, six basics in his hand. So that means he now has 11 cards, and he still has to draw cards. So he's going to go up to 12. I predict a lot of lands in that graveyard at the end of Yost's turn. And now let's see what he's going to do. First piling up again. An Armageddon would be kind of nice now as well, because remember, Icy Manipulator takes a mana to activate, and uh, Felwerstone does nothing uh, by itself. Your opponent needs to have colored lands for it to produce any mana. There we see a strip mine, probably taking one of the Tundras. And now Yost has to discard, so putting four basics there in the graveyard passing turn here. And it's Raymond's turn, and I mean, he's got five mana. If he has a Sarah Angel, that would actually be pretty powerful. Remember, Sarah Angel also getting the bonus from the Crusades, so that would be a 6-6 six, six flyer for five. That would be kind of insane, but Raymond not doing anything at the moment, just passing turn here. And Yost again activating his land tax. Look at him go. Insane, insane value. And it's it's just really nice for, for Yost because he's kind of filtering his deck, right? He's taking out all the lands. And that means he's only going to, probably going to draw into gas more creatures because that is what Yost wants at this, uh, at this point in the game because he's not dealing any damage. That's the big problem for Yost here. Okay, this is what he wants to do, a Savannah Alliance which is now actually a 4-3 Lion because of those Crusades. So that is really good news for him. There is another Plains. Tapping 2 for a Felwerstone. Okay, I was hoping for something else. It looks like Raymond is going to take some more damage next turn. He is still on 11 though, so it's, it's, it's not like he's going to die next turn. But it doesn't look great either. And yeah, we see the tap down of the Savannah Lions. That means he's taking three damage. Going to go drop to eight here. There we see a Soul Ring. Even more lands for Yost. And passing turn. And there is action on the side of Raymond. A Sarah Angel with enough blue open to protect it by a counterspell. Here we see Swords. Will we see a counterspell? That is the big question. There we see a counterspell. And a second Swords. Okay, now it's a Goner. But the good news for Raymond is he's going to take six life from one creature. So he's going to go from eight all the way up to 14. That's going to give him some breathing space. He still has that Icy to deal with that Savannah Lions. That means he only takes three damage a turn. So this Sarah Angel bought him two turns time, which is actually not too bad. There is a Chaos Orb. Is he going to flip it straight away? Because, yeah, I think that's a good decision because Raymond has stepped out. He cannot respond with a Disenchant. Here's the flip. Ooh, that was an awkward one. A complete miss. 
And that could be, that could turn out to be quite costly because that icy is super strong and super annoying for Yost here. And Raymond playing moat. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Beautiful altered moat, by the way, but playing that moat. And all of a sudden, it looks like the tables have turned here. Raymond being under pressure the whole game. But he's still on 11. He's got a moat. He's got an IC. He's the control player. He's all good. And there's that white knight, which is pretty useless because of that moat. And, you know, Yost can only hope for a disenchant and then hope that Raymond doesn't have a counterspell to back it up. Back it up. Here we see an Azure Drake, 2-4 flyer from Legends, 1 blue and 3 to cast. And... Um, it's got really nice flavor text, by the way, if you have a moment to read the flavor text. I think it's kind of funny. Uh, it's a 2-4 and can start attacking. There is a Preacher. This is a really good answer here from Yost on that Ezra Drake. I wonder if we'll see a Swords from Raymond or even a Counterspell. Yeah, we see a Counterspell here on the Preacher. It's actually not the worst news for Yost because now Raymond has a Counterspell less and that means that when Yost draws into a Disenchant, He's got a bigger chance of being able to destroy that moat. Now it's getting risky here for Yost because the Jam Day Tome means that Raymond is going to start drawing cards. And that is a problem. As soon as Raymond has established card advantage, it's a problem. Oh, this is interesting. A Thunder Spirit 2 2 Flyer. This is an Italian edition. You can see it by the vivid colors. And uh, it's now a 4-4 first strike flyer because of those two crusades. That means it can kill the Azure Drake. But of course, Raymond still has his Icy to tap it down if he wants to. Using his JM Day Tome in his main phase now as well. So that means that he's just drawn two extra cards. Let's see what he can do. There is a basic island. And passing turn here. Really wanting to choose to use that Icy defensively makes sense. So he's now going to tap down the Thunder Spirit. That means next turn he can go in for two damage. Yost still being on a healthy 18 total. And Raymond, I mean, it's looking really good for him here. He's on 11. And if we had that advantage bar that you see with the MTG tournaments, then, then Raymond's advantage would be all the way up here because he is the control player. He's in control. He's got card advantage with a Jam Day Tome. And the thing is, the more cards he's drawing, the more likely he is to have a counterspell in hand to protect his moat. And that's all that really matters right now in the game for Raymond. Protect the moat, keep drawing cards with the Tome. That's all that really matters. He's probably going to swing in here with an Azure Drake. That means that Yost is going to drop to 16. Looking at his cards, because he played the Azure Drake, though, he cannot use his Jam Day Tome next turn. Then again, you know, because he has the Ezra Drake, he can start dealing four damage a turn instead of two. So it's definitely worth playing that, committing that to the board. There we see King Suleiman, which is not too relevant because Raymond chose to play with the Ezra Drake instead of, for example, the Surrender Pafrit. And there we see a pass turn here. Untapping everything. And I think Yost needs a miracle here. I mean, there we see a Swords. He's going to draw a card for choosing not to play a Counterspell. And I think even if, if you're Raymond and even if you have a Counterspell, I would just let the Swords resolve because you need to protect your moat. That is the most important thing here. Just protect that moat. As long as you can protect the moat, you're good. Oh, Sarah Angel Brutal 6-6 six, six, Flyer Vigilance. Oh, man. I think, I think Yost, I think your days are numbered here for the first game. Of course, it's just the first game of the finals. There's a tap down of Thunder Spirit. That means a potential of 10. No, sorry. I'm exaggerating. 8 damage next turn. And that means he will drop to 6 if he's unable to answer these threats, flying threats here, eight damage, he's going to drop down to six. Oh, wow. There is another moat. And I mean, this is, this is getting close to impossible for Yost to win here. One moat, it was still kind of do doable, maybe finding some kind of opening to get a disenchant in there. 
but two moats, no, this is it, this is it. Yost is saying, you know, one moat was too much, then two moats is way, way, way over that. So first game here to Raymond, kind of what I expected when I looked at these decks, you know, Yost is going to get off from a flying start, and then Raymond, if he can stretch it into mid-game, late-game, he can probably dictate the game and get the win, and that's exactly what we saw here in game number one. Now, both players are going to go to their sideboards, and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, and here we go. At least Jost is on the play, which is huge for him, right? Getting even more pressure on. There we see an Ecation Javelineers, the 1-1 one, one from Fallen Empires, with an Ecation Javelin counter on it, meaning he can tap it to deal one damage to any target in exchange for that counter. And there's, again, early damage. There's a Mistress Factory. We didn't see a single Mistress Factory in the, in the first game. And a Tundra Wolves as well. So again, a pretty uh, pretty quick start from Yost, as to be expected. Raymond playing a land passing turn here. And there's an attack activating the Factory. Probably going to attack here for four total. And there we see the Swords, of course, on the land. Makes sense. Then again, if you're Yost, you don't need a lot of land. Doesn't really matter that much. And there's a Swords out of the hand of Raymond. And Raymond dropping to 17 here after taking the two damage from the creatures. And is he going to be stuck on mana here? Is he going to be stuck on land? It looks like he's stuck on land. This is huge for Yost. Because Raymond is a deck that just really needs to play out a land every turn. Also, no Felwer Stone from Yost. We do see a Crusade. Are we going to see a counter spell? This could be over really soon. No counter spell from Raymond. And he doesn't seem to have lands. So double trouble here. Taking four damage. Going to drop to 13. At least finding a basic planes. That is something. Can he find, for example, a Felwer Stone to kind of get back into it? Looks like he can. Perhaps a Disenchant on the Crusade. That would kind of help. Second Crusade. Are we going to see a Counterspell? No Counterspell, it seems. That means that he can start dealing 6 damage here? That would mean Raymond would drop to 7. Wow, this second game could be over very, very quickly. Then we see a thumbs up from Raymond. There's the attack. Dropping to 7. Playing another creature. Savannah lines hitting the board. No counter spell again from Raymond. Also seeing a soul ring there. And that means that next turn, Yost can deal 6, 11. He can finish it. He can deal 11 damage. Okay, there we see an orb. He's probably going to flip it on the lion just to survive. I think he kind of has to, right? So activating it. No response from Yost because he's all tapped out. Except for the Soul Ring, but that's not white mana that he needs to potentially play Disenchant in response to the activation. We do see some glitches from Raymond. Let's hope that we do keep a good screen. And there's the flip. And it is a hit. Savannah Lines is a goner. And that buys Raymond one more turn. Maybe if he can find a land and a moat. Oh no, he's on one. I mean, oh, Armageddon. Yeah, there's no way. And next turn, actually, Yost can use the Javelin counter to win this game. Okay, it's already over. Look at that. He's packing, <laughs> packing his cards, saying you've got this game number two. Personally, I would have liked it if they would have kind of finished it and if Yost could have used his Javelin counter. So I'm just going to pretend, Yost, that you've used your Javelin counter. I think uh, Ecation Javelineers is such a cool card, and uh, I'm a big fan of the art of Fallen Empires. Anyway, this was the second game. It's 1-1. And that means we're going to go into game number three. Game number three, the decider. And it looks like they already started with a basic island by Raymond, who was on the play because he lost game number two. So whoever wins this one is going to be the X point old school champion. So that's pretty exciting. Of course, it's a monthly. So I think they already started with their new tournament. But it is pretty exciting. This is a finals. There is a land tax here by Yost, who's not playing out his second land. That means he can start activating it next turn, also dealing damage with the Savannah Alliance. 
So again, a pretty good start for Yost, but I think it's going to really, what's really going to set him back here is the fact that he's not on the plate. It's going to make it difficult. Here we see a time walk. Raymond finding it, and that's actually quite nice here. Probably going to play out another basic. Let's see what he's going to do. Oh, I guess, or is he deciding not to? That is interesting, deciding not to. And the reason for that, obviously, is, uh, well, maybe he doesn't have a land. That could be an option. But if he does, assuming he does, he probably doesn't want to uh, play another land because that basically means that you're telling Yost, you know what, for the rest of this game, you can just use your land text without any consequence. And he doesn't want to do that. And now he's kind of forcing Yost to make... I guess a difficult decision. Is he going to play out another land or is he going to just... Okay, he's going to do it. Because you could also choose not to and then you're guaranteed that you can use your land text again. Of course, all these decisions, they're, um, you know, you make them based on what you have in hand and we cannot see the hands of these players. So there's a Crusade. Savannah Lines going to a 3-2. We've seen Crusade doing a lot of work in this matchup so far. Here we see a Swords by Raymond. And the nice thing about Raymond's deck, because it's control, it doesn't really matter much for Raymond that Yost is gaining life. He's like, you know, potato, potato. If I need two swings with Sarah Angel uh, or one swing, it doesn't really matter that much. Once I have control, I have control. And let's see what he's going to do. Is he going to play out another land here? Yeah, I do think that he's just stuck on land now. Or perhaps it was still strategy. Maybe he... Okay, yeah, there. Now he's starting to play Lance again. Unfortunately for Raymond, he doesn't have double blue open. And there's a Jam Day Tome with a quick Ooh Divine offering here coming from the sideboard. That means even more life for Yost. And it's a really good sideboard card against Raymond. Because that means that Yost also has his disenchance to take care of the moats. And he can just use his Divine Offerings on the Jam Day Tome. So it's a really good decision to board those in. There's the second island finally for Raymond. That means that he, you know, can potentially play a Counterspell now and he's passing turn. The good news, of course, here for Raymond is that, you know, despite the fact that he's not doing all too much, Yost hasn't been able to deal much damage. I mean, Raymond is still on 18, which is pretty good. There's an Ecation Javelin here that's now a 2-2 because of the Crusade. And another basic planes passing turn here. Let's see what Raymond's going to do. Maybe finding another land and, you know, perhaps an IC or something to deal with the Acacian Javelinier. Okay, a Brain Guys are tapping all out. He is going to draw three cards in total. That's, of course, part of the strategy of Raymond. Get that card advantage flow going. He's still on 18. Pretty high life total. Doesn't really matter if he has to take a little bit of damage next turn. And for Yost, there is a little opening here. Because, of course, Raymond cannot counter. He's completely tapped out. First, we see Yost attacking for two here. Dropping Raymond to 16. Going into his second main. And there's Sarah Angel coming from the sideboard. He, I believe he had, he has two Sarah Angels in the sideboard. I'm pretty sure he boarded out King Suleiman. I wonder if he put in extra Preachers as well or if he took those out. The Preachers can be quite useful against Raymond's deck because he is playing with four Sarah Angels and four Azur Drake. So there are targets in his deck. Sometimes these control decks tend to play with no creatures at all and maybe then use um, Mishra's Factories as finishers. Or just a big fireball. But in the case of Raymond, he's playing with creatures. So Preacher could be useful. There we see a Moat. Moat, of course, really strong. But fortunately for Yossi, just played that Sarah Angel. And that Sarah Angel is looking mighty powerful. It's a 5-5 because of the Crusade. So he can swing in for 5. Raymond would drop to 11. Of course, Raymond has that basic planes untapped. Ooh, strip mine on the planes. And there we probably see tapping it for white. Are we going to see a Swords here? There is a Swords to Plowsiers. Beautiful signed one, by the way. And even more life here for Yost, but that really doesn't matter much. And there's a Disenchant on the moat. That's actually pretty good. So Yost is finding some answers. I think the problem, again, is that long-run game strategy. 
where you know we can already see Raymond just having more cards because of that brain geyser and he's on 14 which is still pretty high and Yo's kind of stuck here with just three cards in hand there we see a maze of if and Yo's already having used his one strip mine so that maze is going to be super annoying and there we see also a disrupting scepter which really ties in nicely with Raymond's game plan to get card advantage going. There's an attack of course sending it back with the maze. And that maze is going to be a problem. Look at that three cards for Yost. I'm pretty sure Raymond is going to use his disrupting scepter here. He can use that and keep two blue open for a possible counterspell. So Raymond is kind of in the seat, in the driver's seat, where he wants to be as a control player. This is looking, this is this is this is going to be difficult here for Yost. If he can find an Armageddon, that would be kind of nice. Attacking with both, you're probably going to send back the Javelin near. I think. Well, it doesn't really matter that much. I think if you send back the Factory. Um, he has an extra mana to spend, I guess. So that means two damage here for Raymond. And we see another creature. Okay, that kind of helps. One of the answers to a maze of if is simply play more creatures than there are mazes, and eventually you'll deal some damage. <laughs> so, uh, and that's exactly what Yost is doing now, finding that uh, White Knight, which is a 3 3 for a striker. The problem, of course, being that Disrupting Scepter as well, you know. Josic is going to lose cards. And he was already kind of down on cards because of that uh, Brain Geyser by Raymond earlier in the game. And what is Raymond going to do? Deciding to play a Moat instead of using a Scepter. That is a good decision because that's going to save him some damage. Four cards in hand, passing turn here. Also because of that double Mishra's Factory on the side of Yost. Looking at his hand, two cards in hand. He's kind of, if, if they're useful cards, he's kind of forced to play them out because of that scepter. Unless, of course, it's an instant, like a disenchant, he can wait. Then again, it would be better to play it out, right? Yeah, he plays it out right now. Probably going to go for the moat. There we see a counter spell by Raymond. And Raymond is playing the, the control game very very nicely this is what you want to do you want to use those counter spells on your right pieces that's so important in this case the moat the mo protecting the moat is vital we saw that in an earlier game here i believe it was game two wasn't it where he also wanted to protect that moat moat just being such a game changer in this matchup passing turn here And there is a Tundra Wolves. Doesn't matter much because of that moat. Another Felwer Stone. And this could end up becoming a long and grindy match or not because we see a Sarah Angel here so that Sarah can start bashing away. Now remember, Yost is on 32. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's quite high. That's going to take Yost eight turns. Oh, there we see a Swords, of course. Oh, we've got the Crusade, by the way, so it's a 5-5. Anyway, it's gone now. No counter spell. Yost was tapped out. I mean, Raymond was tapped out. He's now on 17 again. And it's really up to Raymond here to try to find more threats. And eventually, I feel like he's going to win. And Yost needs to find a way here to... Uh... Okay, there we see a damage with the Javelineers. That's quite, a, quite an interesting move by Yost. Maybe he was just getting bored and wanting to do something. And this is really that kind of stillmate feeling um, that I've had a lot when I played against the deck. Disrupting Scepter, discarding his basic land. And this is the game Raymond wants to play. Every turn that this, every turn that this standstill prolongs, it's bad news for Yost. I think, I mean, he needs to find a way to get rid of that moat. Okay, at least this is a flyer, that's something. No counterspell by Raymond, and that makes sense because he still has the Maze of If, right? Tapping four, are we going to see an Icy? Control Magic, I think this, this comes in from the sideboard, wow. 
That is pretty lethal. Control magic on the Thunder Spirit. Oh, wow. Which is a 3-3 because of the Crusade. So he can start dealing 3 damage a turn. And it's so difficult for Yost here. Okay, there's a Preacher. I talked about the Preacher earlier. So he's decided to keep it in. And wow, that Thunder Spirit must be really confused. Because next turn he's probably going to... Go to the other side. And I think it's a good decision from Yost to, to play with the Preacher. Because there are enough targets in Raymond's deck, you know, playing with Azur Drake, a full playset, and Sarah Angel, a full playset. Okay, there was a little, uh, little glitch there, but we're back. And there's three damage in from the Thunder Spirit. So that means Ray, um, um, Yost is going to drop to 29 here. He's having so much life. Another Scepter. And passing turn. Seemed to be a little glitch, but we're back again. And look at that. Yost just playing basic planes, passing turn, waiting for the untap before he steals with Preacher. And, um, yeah, I mean, it is dangerous, of course, because he's now going to use the Preacher pre-combat. Makes absolute sense, so he has to Preacher back. And uh, I wonder if Raymond has something like a Swords. Doesn't even have to use it. <laughs> oh, another control magic. What is he going to control? Oh, man, he's going to control the Preacher. Okay, so he's going to control the Preacher, and he's going to use that to steal a creature next turn with the Preacher. Oh, this is so funny. And I really like the fact, Raymond, that you're writing down the name on the back of those cards. That's kind of keeping it, um, yeah, keeping it easy for us to follow what's happening. I think I'm going to do that as well. I really like that idea. And uh, it looks like they're tinkering a little bit, looking at their setups. I can see uh, Yost, they're going on his, on his computer. So let me see if I can uh, if I can skip this. He's probably looking something up. Maybe looking up what's going to happen when you take over the preacher and if the preacher because the preacher controlled the thunder spirit if it means that Raymond is getting the thunder spirit with the preacher. I don't think that's the case to be honest. There is a disenchant on a control magic. Oh man. Are we going to see a counter spell from Raymond? This is hilarious. I'm exp is he going to counter? That's the question. Is he going to counter? Yeah, he's going to counter. And we probably saw, by the way, a disenchant on the moat, probably, right? Although a disenchant on the preacher, that's he could have done that as well. And um, I guess this is the situation right now. So Raymond has the Thunder Spirit and the Preacher. He's untapping now both of them because he's taking his turn. That means he can use the Preacher to steal another creature from Yost. First, he's going to tap four to cast something. Is it going to be like an Icy or another Moat? It's going to be a Jam Day Tome. Even better here. Good news for Raymond. That means he can get his card advantage train going. He's probably going to swing in, right, with the Thunder Spirit dealing 3 damage. Not sure. Does he have a recall in hand? He's kind of looking at his graveyard. Asking for the amount of disenchants in the graveyard of Yost. Look at that. 3 disenchants already. That's quite a lot. Things are looking really bad for Yost here. The problem is Yost needs to get rid of that moat. And look at this. Look at how defensively Raymond is playing Choosing not to attack with the Thunder Spirit. There is a Sarah Angel. And end of turn here, using his book, going to draw an extra card. And there we see a Preacher activation on end step. And he's going to get the Ecasian Javelinier. Remember, with Preacher, your opponent can choose. So you can tap it to activate it, and then your opponent has to look at his creatures and choose one 
and give that to you. That's how the preacher works. And um, it looks like we saw another source this time on the Sarah of Yost. So look at the life total of Yost. He's on 34. And despite the fact that he's on a lot of life, it's looking really, really, really bad for him. There we see an attack with his own Thunder Spirit, right? So he's going to drop down to 31. And I mean, this is just looking great for Raymond here. He's, he's, he's got everything that he wants to, right? Do, are we going to see a Sarah Angel? And there is a... Oh, oh, okay, Sarah. <laughs> I thought, are you going to play a balance, really? He's going to play a Sarah. Now, at least we know his last card is a balance. And a Sarah Angel on the board. And, uh, okay, we see some stuff happening here. Interesting. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, Sarah Angel on the board. Let's take a look what's going to happen next. There is a basic planes and, oh no, he's tapping the planes for an Ecation Javelin here. Not very relevant. Probably going to swing in here for 3 damage from the Thunder Spirit and 5 damage from the Sarah Angel, I expect. So dealing another 8, that means he's going to drop down to 23. And there is a Chaos Orb to make matters even worse. I mean, this is the final, so I, I understand that Yost wants to play it out completely, but I mean, how can he still win this? The problem here as well is, I mean, the best way to get back when you're behind is balance. The problem for Yost is he also has a lot of creatures on the board. So it's not like he plays a balance and it works as like a Wrath of God and a Mind Twist in one, which sometimes happens when you're this far behind. But in this case, that doesn't work because of all the little creatures he's got. And that mode of Raymond is just protecting him completely from that horde. Okay, this is interesting. Wrath of God... Are we going to see a response? First, he's going to draw a card. Are we going to see a counterspell? If not, okay, Wrath of God. Oh, <laughs> oh, crazy. Still, it doesn't change much. I mean, it's good for Yost. It kind of stops him going down in life, but the control is still with Raymond. The problem is still not being, uh, being solved. You know, you still have the moat, you still have the Jam Day Tome, you still have the Mace. You still are looking at the Disrupting Scepter. So the problems are still there. It's just going to mean that this game is going to take longer. There we see an Ivory Tower. And already Raymond, I believe, probably has a lot of cards in hand. Four cards in hand. So at a certain point, he's going to gain life as well. He's going to tick up. And like I said, I understand Joost because this is the finals. This is a deciding match in the finals of X Point Old School. You're not just going to give up. You want to play and you want to see if you can still make it work somehow. But I'm sure Joost also knows in the back of his mind, I mean, this is just going to be really, really difficult, almost impossible because of everything that's on the board. And already in the graveyard, I should say. Because remember, there are three disenchants already in Yosti's graveyard, and he really needs at least one disenchant to deal with the moat, at least. Passing turn here, and of course, Raymond is gonna use his tome in every end step exactly to draw those extra cards. That means he's gonna gain a life now as well, take up to 17, draw a card for turn, trying to find a creature, preferably a Sarah Angel, to deal some damage. Of course, he's going to use his scepter here. Look at that. And Yost, you know, he's unable to build anything up because of those scepters. Passing turn here. And okay, he's going to activate his land tax. That makes sense. I mean, you don't want to draw into lands, right? At least that's something here for Yost. It's gonna draw some lands, but look at those. Uh, yeah, gonna. <laughs> that's what I wanted to say. Let's count your your cards in your library. Oh man, this is a long and grindy game. Uh, I think that next turn Raymond is gonna use both of his disrupting scepters, right? So we've got three basic lands in hand for Yost and another card. 
that other card being a soul ring completely completely useless drawing an extra card at the end step that means he's get two more life he's gonna tick up to 19 right I think yeah he's gonna tick up to oh to 20 actually and is he gonna use his two scepters well he basically knows there are only lands in his hand right well he, why not but you also want to keep mana for your tome although he's already used to tome I see so keeping two blue open for a counter spell with the tundra and basic island having six cards in hand that's ridiculous Passing turn here, again using the land tax. And shuffling up again. Maybe Yost will deck himself. I'm not really sure how many Sarah Angels Raymond has played out this game. I think one, maybe two. We'll see. We'll see soon enough if he can find some Sarahs. It would be nice if he can kind of finish the game with uh, with uh, Sarah Angel. Going to go up to 22 here because of the Ivory Tower. Going to use his Disrupting Scepter twice. So more lands into the graveyard of Yost. And yeah, this is really, this is kind of what you expect to see sometimes in these control matches that you know as soon as the control player takes over the game gets really grindy and there's just not too much happening actually i shouldn't say grindy the game kind of comes to a halt i should say because the control is with raymond whereas in a grindy game there's this standstill where you're trying to get one point of damage through on one side, one point of damage on the other side, and it's really like there's a lot of tension. I think in this game, at this point, there's not really a lot of tension anymore. There's just full control by Raymond. And again, I really understand that Yost wants to play this out because he has made it all the way to the finals. It's 1-1. Maybe there's an out. Maybe there's something strange that's going to happen. You know, who, who knows? Who knows? And then he can maybe still get the victory, of course, one of the many problems that Yost has is that ivory tower. Here we see double creature, preacher, and uh, order of Lightbur. And what I wanted to say is one of the many creatures uh, problems, sorry, that uh, that Yost has here. While we see a swords to plowsiers on uh, the preacher, is um, that ivory tower. The ivory tower means that every turn Raymond is getting even more life, and the only kind of thing that Yost had going for him was that Raymond was well not even that low but was lower on life but now look at his life totals total it keeps ticking up he's at 32 right now and uh yeah one lonely order of light burr maze of if right so he has to discard his savannah alliance gonna go through his deck maybe he's got a recall in hand I didn't, he, he went through his deck so quickly, I couldn't see if there was a Sarah in the bin. I don't think so. I think the Sarah was sourced in his passing turn. I wonder if Raymond, and maybe Raymond, you can tell us what sideboard choices you made, because maybe you decided to take out some of your creatures, put in some more control elements, for example, those control magics. Uh, I'm curious. And look at, <laughs> look at the life. He needs four dice. Just for his life total. That's ridiculous. And uh, if you'd like to join uh, X Point Old School, by the way, uh, check the description below. There you will find a timestamp. No, not a timestamp, sorry. A link, of course. There you'll find a link to the Facebook page of uh, X Point Old School. And uh, you can join them. And they have monthly uh, online leagues that you can join. There is a Sarah Angel by Raymond. Okay, okay, okay. Let's see if the Sarah Angel can stick. And if it can start dealing some damage. Who knows? There is a Thunder Spirit. Okay. 
are we going to see a counter spell? I don't think so, actually. Why would you counter it? You can, uh, you can flip on it. You can steal it as well with the control magic. And even more life here, of course, for Raymond because of that continuing ivory tower. Ticking up, ticking up, ticking up. The problem is not gaining life. The problem here is dealing damage. And uh, yeah, attacking here for four, right? Well, five actually because of the crusade. Yost taking damage, deciding not to block with the Thunder Spirit. Why would he? He's still pretty high up in life. Look at all those lands on the side of Raymond. Ridiculous. Passing turn. And you know if Yost is not playing out his card, that means just that Raymond's going to use his Disrupting Scepter. And he's actually stopped... Okay, he is going to use his tome. I want to say he stopped using his tome, but he's deciding to use it nonetheless. The thing is, he's got to be careful here. He doesn't want to go deck dead, right? I think that's kind of the only way for Yost to still win this one. There we see a Disrupting Scepter, and it was an Armageddon in Yost's hand. And another attack is going to go to 15. There we see an Icy Manipulator. Yeah, I think we're really reaching the end of the game now that Icy can start tapping down the Thunder Spirit as well. Three more turns here for Yost. Swords on the Angel. Is that going to work? Okay, lucky. I'm actually happy with this counter spell because, <laughs> you know, I just want to see this, this final coming to an end. But, you know, I do appreciate it, Yost, that you keep, you know, fighting until the end. I do appreciate that. Uh, unfortunately for you, the swords got countered. Of course, uh, that was to be expected with so many cards in hand. So a counter spell on the swords. Of course, end of turn, tap down of the Thunder Spirit. Also an activation of the Gem Day Tome. And an untap of all those lands. And yeah, let's put that life total away. We know you're on a zillion life. It doesn't matter. It's probably going to swing in here with the Sarah. Going to put Yost on 10. That's exactly what he does. Two more turns to go in this X point finals. Another icy manipulator. And I have to say, Raymond, I really enjoy looking at your cards and your collections. Beautiful. And I also really like that Italian thunder spirit, by the way. There is another source. If he's not able to counter this, who knows? Maybe maybe Raymond will go deck dead. I mean, I think Yost has drawn more cards because of the land tax activations, but who knows? Okay, there's a mana drain. And uh, yeah, no cards anymore for Yost. And I think like 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 part of, of, the, of the many problems that Yost had to face at a certain point, those disrupting scepters came into the game and that kind of forced Yost to play everything out. And that's a big problem because you cannot, there, there's zero surprise, right? You have to draw a card and then play your card out. There's nothing uh, you can do. Okay, it looks like the players have actually stopped. Um, I think, Yost, did you give up here or what happened? Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's kind of a strange ending to the finals. Uh, this was the finals of uh, X Points Old School. Uh, I would like to first thank um, Louis. Louis is the organizer of X Point Old School. Thank you for uh, sharing these recordings with me. It's been a blast to look at this final. Well, game three, you know, at a certain point, we kind of all knew who was going to win. But game one and game two, they were very, very exciting to look at. And um, if you're interested in this format, like I said before, you can find a link to their Facebook page in the description below so you can check it out and uh, and you can join and you can join the fun if you want to. Uh, I also would like to thank Raymond and of course Yoast for sharing their decks and their games with me here on Timmy Talks with the channel. I would also like to thank you for watching another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And did I already congratulate you, Raymond? Congratulations, Raymond, on winning this monthly 
of the X Point Old School League. Well, well done. And uh, it looks like it's well deserved as well. You also played very good magic in the semis and now you played it in the finals also. So congratulations to you, sir. And to you, the viewer, if you would like to support the channel, and I'm pretty sure you would love to, you can leave a like, leave a comment. Let me know what you think of this format. If you're not a subscriber yet, please consider subscribing. It really helps the channel moving forward. And another thing you can do is you can become a patron of the channel. There's probably an info card popping up right now. Click on that card and um, yeah, you can sponsor the show. It already starts with a dollar and you can also join Timmy on Discord when you're a patron. So go and check that out. Talking about patrons, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at our fantastic, amazing channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Ik het als fikker te samba kan zien.